Order. We must move to questions to the Minister of Justice. I must inform members that questions 1, 2, 4, 5 and 8 have been withdrawn. I call Cathy Oshin. Yeah, Principal Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions 3 and 7 together. Criminal justice inspection reports are based against four healthy prison tests – safety, respect, purpose, purposeful activity and resettlement. I am pleased that McGilligan Prison was assessed positively in three of the four tests. In the area of resettlement, McGilligan was assessed as providing good outcomes for prisoners. This is the first time this has ever been achieved by the prison service, and it must be commended for that. However, the prison was also criticised in a number of areas, specifically the nature of its accommodation and the level of purposeful activity for prisoners. I can confirm that a number of recommendations have already been actioned and implemented, and that the management team is developing an action plan to address the remaining recommendations, which I will publish in due course. The prison service has produced the outlined business case for the development of a new prison on the existing site, and this has been accepted, subject to finances being made available. It is important to recognise that the planned rebuild of McGilligan will address a number of criticisms within the report, especially the provision of in-cell sanitation for all prisoners. There are plans in place from April 2015 to outsource the learning and skills function, forming a partnership with Northwest Regional College. It is expected that this will improve the learning opportunities available to prisoners in McGilligan. And Mr. O'Shane for a supplementary. Uh, would the Minister not agree with me that a substantial section of the report actually displayed a backward and retrograde uh, movement uh, in McGilligan Prison? And what steps will he put in place to address that uh, there is no further slippage? Well, I thank Mr. Ocean for his question, Principal Deputy Speaker, but I don't agree with him. A substantial section of the report relates to matters going back. There's certainly one section which is uh, definitely acknowledged to be going back. That's why I referred to the action plan being put in place to deal with those matters, the ongoing work being developed around the potential capital rebuild, and in particular the short-term work to improve the opportunities for learning and skills training in conjunction with Northwest College. I believe that those uh, elements of work and a lot of work which has already been done show that the report has been noted and action is being taken to ensure that the prison improves. Mr Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The CGI, uh, CGI report on McGilligan uh, highlighted the uh, level of drug use was high and that no disciplinary consequences for positive drug tests were taken. Can I ask the Minister whether he wishes to comment on that? and what action he can have in conjunction with the prison service to tackle the high levels of use of, of both illegal drugs and prescription drugs within our prisons? Well, again, I thank Mr Ross for the question, which highlights one of the key areas of problems. The specific issue when he talks about prescription drugs is, of course, one which is largely for the prison services partners in the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust to deal with that, and a lot of work is being done around issues like supervised swallow for the most vulnerable prisoners and the most potent drugs to ensure that those are not misused. Other work is being done, including initiatives with the PSNI to address the potential for smuggling in. There have been a number of successful prosecutions of individuals caught seeking to smuggle contraband into prisons, and the work being done on an intelligence-led basis, as well as the routine work searching people, the use of drug dogs when people are arriving in the prison, are all examples of work being taken forward. But clearly, there is a problem with drugs in this society, and prisons are not immune. Call Claire Sumter. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I recently visited McGilligan. I think the recommendations in the report are not unfounded um, and do need to happen as soon as possible. Does the Minister have a timeline for when the refurbishment of McGilligan will take place? Well, the key problem uh, in addressing Ms. Sugden's question, Principal Deputy Speaker, relates to the issue of capital availability. The outlined business case has been submitted and approved, but there are clearly very major issues for such a significant capital investment, and that is a matter which will need to be addressed as we look at the budget in the coming period in conjunction uh, with the Department of Finance. The rebuild certainly will be done on a phased basis which will allow uh, work to be carried through on the kind of scheme which does not require an enormous amount of capital at any one time, but we all know that the financial difficulties and the problems that arise. And what is clear is that there is an urgent need, in particular, to address the living accommodation within McGilligan. Well, Mr. John Dallet. 
Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister may be aware that in the distant past, the dreaded Public Accounts Committee singled out McGilligan for its excellent education programmes. What on earth has happened since he took control of it, and when is he going to put the investment into that prison that's badly needed? Well, I thank Mr. Dalla for his question. I'm not sure whether he's entirely referring to purely the education matters when he talked about investment, because I've just highlighted the problems of capital investment. But there is clearly an issue which has been highlighted by the way the prison service, prior to my time, adopted a policy of partnership with the South Eastern Trust in health and social care matters. And there is an advantage seen of partnership with local FE providers to ensure that there's a better way of ensuring that prisoners can undertake courses within prison and then be transferred to external courses when they're discharged in a way which better meets their needs than simply trying to employ teachers within the prison system itself. I believe that that is a way which will make very significant differences, not just in McGilligan, but also most particularly in the work being done around the transformation of Hyde Bank Wood. Well, Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question six. The bar operates on a con competitive basis, and it's the case that some barristers are not able to attract a caseload which would equate to a full-time job. Mm -hmm. However, this does not mean that if they're performing efficiently and effectively, they're working for below the minimum wage for those cases they are involved in. Criminal fees in Northern Ireland have been benchmarked against fees paid in England and Wales. Even following the latest round of reforms, they will remain competitive in comparison. I've consulted on reform to the fees paid in civil and family courts. My officials are currently finalizing fee proposals for family and children proceedings, which will reduce baseline costs by approximately 20% overall. I plan to introduce a new structure which will provide for standard fees in the majority of cases, will reduce the level and complexity of the administration of civil legal aid, and contribute to reductions in costs. The new arrangements are intended to provide standard fees based on specific case types. They're based on an accepted swings and roundabouts approach and reflect that cases will be put into bandings and fees will reflect the work required. These proposals are still the subject of discussion with the Bar Council. It is incumbent upon me, Principal Deputy Speaker, to ensure that the legal aid budget is used effectively and delivers value for money. I've already delivered reform of fees in criminal cases and I'm taking forward reform of civil fees. There is no evidence that the reforms will result in fees that equate to the minimum wage. Call Mr. Sprott for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister accept that there are many young junior barristers who are actually working uh, for the minimum wage uh, in terms of cases? Uh, and in many cases, some of those bright young barristers will be driven out of the profession as a result of some of the cuts that the Minister has put on to legal aid already. And then the additional level of 15% on fees will actually drive young people out, creating a problem for the future in terms of barristers at the bar. The Minister must accept that. No, Principal Deputy Speaker, the Minister doesn't have to accept that. It is not a case that people are working for below the minimum wage. It is clearly a case that there are, per head of population, many more barristers in Northern Ireland than in neighbouring jurisdictions and it is clear that not all of them can obtain full-time work. But that is not my fault. That is the reality of a profession which is operating on a competitive basis, as indeed happens in the case of other professions and other businesses. My job is to ensure that there is access to justice for those who need justice. It is not the role of the DOJ to provide an employment service for solicitors or barristers. And in the context of the cuts which are being imposed on my budget, it is simply not possible to say that it will be uh, easy to manage without making further cuts to the legal aid budget as we also cut the budgets of every other spending area across the justice system. Well, Mr. Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. I note in his answer that he made no reference to the 15% levy. Does he now accept that there is both fundamentally unfair and therefore fundamentally flawed to, to go forward with, with that type of levy? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the levy was on very much a par with the existing arrangements which allowed for reductions in payments on those cases which were assessed by the taxing master. Since the proposal was initially put forward, there has been uh, a specific decision of the Supreme Court relating to a case involving the Assembly Government in Wales 
which has raised questions about the viability of such a proposal. I am examining that, the implications of that closely with my officials at the present time. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would just like to ask the Minister if he has any idea of the number of barristers who would be working for less than the national minimum wage. And if that number is significant, would he consider perhaps a redistribution or structure of the fee system? I have an absolutely precise figure for those who are working below the national minimum wage principle, Deputy Speaker. For the benefit of Mr. Cree and anybody else who didn't hear it, there are no barristers working for below the national minimum wage. There may be those, manus, uh, those barristers who do not uh, have enough cases to obtain enough fees to equate to an annual salary, which would be the equivalent of the national minimum wage. But for the employment which they are engaged in and paid from the Legal Aid Fund, there are none of them receiving less than the hourly rate for national minimum wage. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, Last week, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I received a bundle of letters from young, young barristers, male and female, who were struggling at the bar uh, and who certainly were earning less than the minimum wage. Would the Minister now like to apologise to those young men and women uh, for his dismissive remarks in relation to their income and his ill-informed remarks in relation to their income? Principal Deputy Speaker, the rates which are set for the employment of solicitors and barristers do not fall less on an hourly basis than the national minimum wage. But what is clear is that there are so many barristers in Northern Ireland relative to other jurisdictions that they cannot all receive a living from that legal aid fund alone, given the fact that there are clearly those in more senior practice who earn very substantial sums from the legal aid budget. Uh, it's not my job to distribute the fees. It's a matter as to how the bar uh, regulates its profession, and it's a matter of how cases are allocated. But that is not my responsibility. Those who do the work are paid the fee for the work they do. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Has the minister given any thought to the uh, consequences of his crusade on legal aid in respect of family courts and civil legal aid and the removal thereof in many instances. Has he given any thought to the implosion in the number of explosion in the number of personal litigants that that is going to create within our courts? And in consequence, we're going to see our courts clogged up with personal litigants. Has he given any thought to the consequences of that? Well, as ever, Mr. Alistair starts arguing from a false premise. I have no more a crusade against lawyers paid from legal aid than I have a crusade against prison officers, police officers, probation officers, those who work in the courts and youth justice, and every other spending area of the justice system which has had to be cut because of the budget cuts imposed on my department. So when Mr. Allison uses lines like crusade, he simply isn't recognizing the reality of the budget that I am faced with. But when he asks as to what the implications are, you, though there are no suggestions from the evidence I have seen that by reducing some elements of scope where money is in play or by avoiding some people using legal aid as a battering ram against an ex-partner who is ineligible for legal aid over family cases, that we will vastly increase the number of litigants in person. The question is to ensure that there is a basic funding for key hearings, but where family cases are at play, People should not be allowed to abuse the legal aid system to punish an ex-partner over minor trifles like variations in the time of access. Mr. Colin Eastwood is not in his place. I call Mr. Basil McRae. Question number nine, please, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am advised that a complaint has been received by the Police Ombudsman's Office and the matter is currently under investigation. The PPS is entirely independent of my department. However, the Director of Public Prosecutions has commissioned Sir Keir Starmer to conduct a review of the prosecution of three interlinked cases involving sexual abuse and terrorist-related charges. I have asked for early warnings of Sir Keir's review of any issues that would impact on the support provided to victims across the justice system. Mr. McRae for supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister accept that there is a danger in having a number of independent reviews, that one organisation may blame the other and that we wouldn't get to the bottom of it? Would he accept that the time has now come for him and his department to have an overarching investigation into this sorry state of affairs? Or would he prefer to see trial by media, as apparently we're going to see tonight on Spotlight? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr McRae may make a point about trial by media, but I don't control the BBC uh, or many another thing. The reality is that there are a number of issues in the cases highlighted by Maria Cattle and others which require individual agencies of the justice system in Northern Ireland and individual agencies of the justice system in the Republic to conduct their inquiries, to do their work, to carry out their investigations, to see whether there are opportunities for prosecution. I have discussed the issue on a number of occasions, most recently in the last week of February, with my colleague Francis Fitzgerald, the Minister of Justice and Equality. We have looked at what the options are for wider reviews but setting up a cross-border review, as has been suggested by some people, would be a very complex issue. And at this stage, the important thing is to allow the relevant agencies to conduct their work and then see, after ensuring that there is no interference with the justice system, that an appropriate way of examining matters further is then looked at, whether that be a specific inquiry in Northern Ireland, a related inquiry cross-border or whatever. We are open to see what is appropriate at that stage but at this stage, we have to allow the work of the Ombudsman, the Garda Shikana, the PSNI, and the DPP to be carried through. Call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And whilst there may be questions for the justice system to answer, the biggest questions are the ones that should be directed at the provisional Republican movement and its institutionalised systematic cover-up of sexual abuse. But, Minister, what assurance can you give to the families, particularly living along the border, where sex abusers were moved routinely over the last number of years, that yourself and the Garda and the Justice Minister in the South are sharing and cooperating fully in relation to the movement uh, and sharing of intelligence about those abusers? Well, I appreciate Mrs. Kelly's point, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure that I'm in the business of sharing information. It is my job to ensure that the justice system is properly funded and properly run. And I have certainly encouraged and understand that there has been sharing of information both ways between the PSNI and the Garda Shikana, uh, that there is work being done on a general cross-border basis some of which falls under the, the work which is done under the general heading of the Intergovernmental Agreement on Criminal Justice Cooperation, work being shared on support for victims, work being done on the specific criminal investigations. All of that is being done to see that we do our best to, first of all, find out the facts, then see if prosecutions are appropriate, and in parallel, support the victims of whatever abuse may have occurred. I believe that that is being done properly in both jurisdictions at the present time, and Francis Fitzgerald and I are committed to ensuring that that remains the case. Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, sexual abuse is a horrible crime. Can the Minister join with me in expressing the hope that people who have any information about uh, sexual harassment or sexual, sexual criminal activity, particularly if they were involved at the hands of illegal terrorist organisations, and the fear exists about coming forward that they will receive whatever reassurances, help and succour and support from within uh, his department in order to get to the truth of any allegations that they may have. Well, certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm very happy to agree with Mr Campbell's point. Anybody who has any information about any crime should be reporting it. The, the issue of sexual abuse can at times be a hugely complex issue, whether it be family relationships or allegations about particular organisations. Uh, there are ways in which people can come forward, receive help and assist in prosecutions, whether they contact the police, whether they contact social services, whether they go through other agencies. But the important issue is that information should be passed on so the victims can be supported and action can be taken against the perpetrators. Call Ms. Michelle McElvey. Question 10, Mr. Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker. Primary intervention and prevention is best achieved through ready access to a comprehensive range of universal entitlements such as education, health and social services. Within the justice system, the term early intervention refers to targeted services for those children and young people who are assessed at being at high risk of first-time offending 
or who already display early signs of criminal or antisocial behaviour. For these children and young people, the principal aim is to keep them out of the formal justice system where appropriate, with many of them needing little assistance to growing out of this behaviour. Research shows that overall life outcomes for these children are improved if their involvement with the justice system is limited at this early stage. To achieve this, my department provides a range of support and funding aimed at diversion through, for example, the funding of policing and community safety partnerships, including the Priority Youth Intervention Programme and the Asset Recovery Community Scheme. My department has also established a system of youth engagement clinics to assist in the identification of and early intervention in those cases which are deemed suitable for diversion from the court system. Efficient application of the youth engagement process speeds up case processing and gives the fullest consideration to diversionary processes. This early intervention scheme brings together the PPS, the police and the youth justice agency with the young person and their family where joint and informed decisions can be made. The scheme has processed approximately 700 referrals to date. Ms. McElveen for a supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer, um, within which he made reference to um, youth engagement clinics. Could I ask the Minister just how effective he believes these have been in diverting young people away from the courts? Well, I appreciate the question. The key issue is, as I said, the early intervention, the engagement to ensure that people are presented with the options including in some cases a restorative option, including additional support coming in, so that by uh, ensuring that at the engagement clinic, young people get the chance to hear about the potential options, the disposal is likely to be directed by the PPS, the options which are then open to them, so they can seek a better way forward. Uh, out of those 700 cases which have been uh, held so far, something like 98% of the young people involved have accepted a diversionary disposal, which removes them from the formal system, gives them, in effect, a second chance if they're a first offender, gives them the opportunity to make amends, to understand the consequences of their action, and be supported away from the potential for otherwise engagement in criminal activity on a more intense basis. Call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister uh, believe that raising the age of criminal responsibility would help in the efforts to avoid criminalising young people? Well, I thank my colleague for that question. There is clearly a polarised view within this Assembly on the issue of the minimal age of criminal responsibility. The Youth Justice Review recommended that it should be increased from 10 to 12 and potentially to 14. I certainly believe that there is justification in increasing the minimum age of criminal responsibility to 12. Uh, given that the tiny number, generally a couple of dozen in any one year of 10 and 11 year olds who may become involved with the justice system, tend to almost overwhelmingly be dealt with by a care process rather than a criminal sanction. And it does seem to me there are real dangers if we get young people involved in that part of the criminal justice system at such an early age. Clearly the important issue has to be to divert young people away from a path of crime on whatever basis it operates. Well, Ms. Palm Cameron. Question number 11. Following the Schofield report, my department agreed to review the policy and regulations underpinning the Police Injury on Duty Scheme. That work is well advanced and it is hoped that draft regulations will be published for consultation this spring. The department also agreed to provide guidance on reassessments which was issued to the Policing Board on the 19th of December last. Mr Cameron for her supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. And he's already mentioned the Schofield report, and um, obviously there are a number of changes um, required to legislation and regulations for the scheme. Uh, so when can I ask the Minister more specifically when he anticipates um, bringing forward his actual proposals to implement the recommendations? Well, I appreciate Mrs Cameron's point, but in fact it is an issue where there is work to be done between my department and the policing board. Um, the specific responsibilities for administering the scheme lie with the board. My department merely has the role in terms of looking at guidance, and that guidance has been issued. I'm quite happy to continue to work with the policing board over how that guidance is implemented and to ensure that we get the regulations right. I certainly hope that will be within the next few weeks. But the key issue is to ensure that the department and the board each play their, you know, their part appropriately 
and that we get a better system than was the case uh, in recent terms to deal with the very significant numbers of PSNI officers who have made IOD claims. Well, Mr. Jim Mallister. The Minister refers to having uh, provided guidance to the Policing Board, I think you said some three months ago. In light of that, is the Minister satisfied that the Policing Board is addressing this issue with the expedition that it deserves, given the long, many years that it has straddled uh, without resolution? Well, I'm not sure whether Mr. Alistair has any specific points he wishes to make to suggest that the Policing Board is not carrying out its statutory duties. I'm concerned to see that the Department and the Board work together as effectively as possible, recognising the distinct responsibilities that the two agencies have. But the important issue is to see that we do, after the various court cases which have happened in England, get the situation back on track to ensure that the needs of injured officers are met. I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, question number 12, please. Currently, all applications for standard and basic checks are being issued by Access NI within three to five days, and over 70% of enhanced applications are being issued in six to eight days. Given that 125,000 applications are made to Access NI each year, I believe this is a good indicator of efficiency. That said, there are some cases that take longer. These are cases referred to the police for consideration. The vast bulk of these are also turned around efficiently, but I acknowledge, as does the PSNI, the delays are occurring and at times these could be significant. My officials, mindful of the impact on applicants who are unable to secure positions of employment without an Access NI check, are working closely with the PSNI to reduce the current delays being experienced by a small minority of applicants. PSNI has approved additional resources for this work, but it will take time to effect the necessary improvements and reduce the current backlog. Well, Claire Sugden for a supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer, but I was actually referring to the inefficiency of having to get a new Access NA form for every organisation that you're involved with, which I actually think is ridiculous and a heavy burden on the community voluntary sector in particular. Um, how has the Minister um, consulted with the community voluntary sector in light of that? Well, I entirely agree with Ms Sugden on that. Um, indeed, before the change of the last Westminster government in the first year of devolution of justice, work was being done to look at the issue of a portable check, which was then changed because of changes within the Home Office, which meant that we couldn't proceed on the time scale that we had hoped. We have provisions for the introduction of a portable check within the Justice Bill, which is currently a committee stage, and perhaps Ms. Sugden would last to, uh, like to ask the Chair of the Committee how speedily he's going to progress that one for it, because it is clear that we need to move to a portable check as soon as possible, although it may not be available until sometime during the next calendar year because of the issues which need to be done to, you know, to tie in the system to the available resources. Uh, we will certainly then also be looking at the issue of the current charges. Um, it's, you know, the current charge in England and Wales is £13 to be annually registered, which is somewhat less than the current one-off fee uh, in Northern Ireland but will continue to be free of charge for those who use the cheque purely for volunteering purposes. So I would hope that we will see progress arising from the work being done by my officials in parallel with the progress of the bill, but it's clearly going to be, unfortunately, not until 2016 before we see it in place. Mr Trevor Lund is not in his place. I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'm delighted that the Minister has continued to answer questions briefly and succinctly, which brings us up to question 14. Not sure what hands I will make of that, Principal Deputy Speaker. I met with chief executives, members of the policing board, heads of statutory bodies who had designated members of policing and community safety partnerships on the 25th of February. We considered a range of issues relating to the partnerships, including measures to maximize their impact on local policing and community safety priorities and to ensure they play a key role in the new community planning structures. This meeting followed ongoing discussions between officials from the DOJ and the policing board and chief executives and other key stakeholders in preparation for the new community planning structures. The recent Sijini report and the recommendations it made provided the opportunity to address a broader range of strategic and operational issues and to reshape the partnerships accordingly. Sijini's recommendation that PCSP action plans should feed into community plans and that alignment with the aims of the statutory partners and other central government strategies should be explicit will, when implemented, further strengthen the links between PCSPs and community plans. The Joint Committee will provide guidance to the reconstituted PCSPs 
on a range of PCSP-related business, including on how to prepare their action plans and will include advice that the plans should feed into community plans. Order. Time is up. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. Uh, Mr. Pat Sheehan is not in his place. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Why did the Minister lobby and secure agreement that the legislation to introduce the HIU would not pass through this House, but will pass through Westminster, in consequence denying this House the opportunity to scrutinise that legislation? Because, Principal Deputy Speaker, there are significant issues on the timing of legislation, the fact that there will be elements of the HIU which may, might relate on a UK-wide basis and would therefore have to be considered by the Westminster Parliament anyway, and to ensure that we got, subject to other discussions over the last 24 hours, the HIU into place as soon as possible. Mr Alistair, first supplementary. Is the truth not that the Minister was running scared of scrutiny in this House? on issues such as how you would recruit the HIU and whether Garda members would be eligible and investigative officers maybe from the PSNI or dare one say at the RUC would not be admissible as, a recruiters, uh, as those who could be recruited? Is it such scrutiny of, of matters such as that that the Minister was running scared of? Principal Deputy Speaker, if members of this House who have not sat at the party leaders' meetings on Monday afternoons uh, saw what happened inside that room to proposals being put forward by anybody, including by me as Minister and officials from the DOJ, they wouldn't suggest that there's no scrutiny in that gathering. I call Ms. Claire Sugden. I scored a hat trick here, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would ask the Minister to give his assessment of how he feels the reform of legal aid will affect access to justice for the most vulnerable when it's likely that solicitors will not be able to provide the service because of the cuts. Well, I'm afraid I have to disagree with the premise on which that question is based, because what we are looking at is reforms which will, to some extent, alter scope around things like money damages which will alter scope in terms of your know, continual applications uh, on uh, family matters for access and so on, but will fundamentally preserve a fee similar to that which applies in England and Wales and generally in excess of that which applies in England and Wales for ongoing cases for the work that is done. The reality is we have to live within the budget and the budget for legal aid has been exceeded every year since some time before devolution happened. That is no longer possible and therefore cuts have to be made. But a lot of work has been done on the work that's been done so far to ensure that there is no reduction in access to justice. That will continue to be my aim. But the reality is that fees in Northern Ireland have traditionally been paid at a more generous level, which slightly contradicts the kind of view which is put forward by bodies like the Law Society when they suggest that external bodies could come in and provide legal back office services because costs of running a business in Northern Ireland are lower than elsewhere in the Western world. Ms. Sugden for supplementary. I uh, thank uh, the Minister for his response. And I, I don't accept that we're comparable to England and Wales because of our specific social circumstances, so I do reject that rationale. Um, how has the Minister um, consulted with the general public on how this might affect them if these uh, reforms are put in place? Well, the rationale that I was explaining there was not my rationale. That was the rationale put forward by the Law Society when they talked about costs being less. So I suggest Ms Sugden, if she thinks that, that I'm wrong, she take it up with the Law Society who I was quoting on that particular matter. Um, in terms of consultation, every issue which has been raised, as frankly everything that the Department of Justice has done since I became Minister, has been the subject of public consultation, though clearly in many cases it's only been those with specific interests who have commented on them. But there's been a public consultation process which has included everything which has been proposed or everything which will be proposed in the future. The member listed at topical question number four has withdrawn their name. I call Mr Cattle Boylan. Thank you, Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I could ask the Minister how much money has been spent on the refurbishment of Armagh Courthouse in the last number of years. How much will be saved if this courthouse closes, and also um, has he any plans for the future use of that building? 
Well, the simple answer to a question as specific as that, Principal Deputy Speaker, is no, I cannot tell the Minister how much money was spent on refurbishment before my time as Minister. I cannot say how much the current running costs are. All of those figures are available in the, at least possibly not the refurbishment, but the ongoing costs and the anticipated savings are available in the consultation document which was circulated by my department and which is readily available to anybody, not just to MLAs. Uh, the issue about future use of the courthouse is not an issue for my department because the issue is if any building is redundant from the use of my department, it is offered to other public bodies and then put on the open market for sale. Well, Mr. Cathal Boylan for a supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for that answer? But could I ask the Minister what assessment has his department taken on the impact the closure will have on the most vulnerable in the area and uh, how will they access uh, justice in the future? And also, can he confirm that the other facilities that are to remain open after this consultation process will be able to deliver the same services that Armagh Courthouse, Courthouse has been delivering? Well, again, Principal Deputy Speaker, I refer Mr Boylan to the consultation document, which makes clear about the transfer of business to buildings which are better able to meet the needs of 21st century justice, you know, this, the significantly better buildings that we have in the more modern parts of our estate, and makes clear how that will be carried through to ensure continuing access to justice, including access to court sittings. Uh, I do notice that in, um, in at least the case uh, where there was a review done of the closure of Bangor Courthouse and the transfer of business to Newton Arts, it was seen to actually proceed more efficiently on the amalgamation of the two courts. So there's no reason to suggest that there will be any restriction on access to justice. I call Mr. Frau McCann. Is the Minister concerned that the family of John Pat Cunningham has stated that there is no confidence in the PSNI to carry forward the investigation into his murder, murder by the British Army in 1974? Well, clearly, I would be concerned if I thought there was any issue about uh, public confidence in the PSNI in general, Principal Deputy Speaker. But the reality is, when we look at issues which happened 40 years ago, there are so many matters which come into play that it's a long way from my responsibility to ensure confidence in the work of the PSNI as they police 2015 and not 1974. Mr. McCann, for a supplement. Sir, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, I think the Minister has opinions on all, all other agencies uh, carrying out investigations, but does this point up the need for the creation of the HIU uh, to address the legacy issues, particular murders carried out by st uh, state forces? Well, I think we, ne we need to be very careful before we talk about murders carried out by state forces in the plural. Um, if he's going to say allegations of murders carried out by state forces, it might be slightly accurate. Yes, I've, I fully support the concept of the HIU. Uh, that's why the DOJ has been doing a lot of work since the 23rd of December to establish the HIU to ensure that it can operate in a way which provides confidence and deals with the past and separates out the PSNI today from the toxic issues of the past. Call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. But, um, <clears throat> can the Minister uh, give me a date for the full implementation of the National Crime Agency? And does he have any idea of the civil case backlog on outstanding on the National Crime Agency? I'm afraid, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't give Mr. Craig an exact date. My, uh, the best answer I can give is two months from the point when the necessary order is passed in Westminster, but I haven't seen that specifically timetabled, though my understanding is due in the next week or 10 days. Uh, but that, I mean, that certainly is the intention, that the necessary measure would be passed through Westminster, both houses, in advance of the dissolution of Parliament for the general election, and certainly the timescale is two months from that date. As to the specific issues of civil backlog, I don't have the details in front of me at the moment, uh, but I did at the time when we were debating the issue, uh, point out that we had had something like a 70% reduction in the number of civil cases which could be considered, and clearly that is now something which can be stepped back up again. Craig, for supplementary. Yep. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> would the Minister be at all surprised to learn that that backlog is now standing at an astonishing figure of almost £14 million and growing? And is, can the minister confirm that there is also growing evidence that uh, serious crime 
uh, groups are actually now basing themselves in Northern Ireland because of the lack of the National Crime Agency. And the sooner we get it implemented, the better with regard to that aspect of crime. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm quite prepared to accept Mr Craig's figure if he's saying £14 million. It would be very similar to the, you know, the understanding I had a few months ago. Um, I'm not sure how much evidence there is, but there's certainly a concern on the part of the police and other agencies that if we haven't proceeded to legislate, or at least to pass the order to allow the legislation to pass at Westminster to make the NCA fully operational here, there would have been a very significant risk of a number of international <coughs> crime groups establishing here. And, and if Mr Craig is suggesting that had already begun to happen, all the more reason to see that we get the NCA operational and fully supported by public representatives in this House in the important work it will be doing in fighting that kind of crime. Mr Barry McElduff. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to provide his assessment of the current situation with regard to the separated regime at Row House in McGabbery Prison? The separated regime in Row House operates as it has done for a significant period of time. It long predates the devolution of justice. There have been as ever continuing difficulties at times with some of those within the separated regime. Following on from the stock take report by the assessment team, uh, work has been done to seek uh, to create a better atmosphere and prison service staff have done a lot of work, uh, including uh, some measures in terms of improvement of the supervision ratios that have been seen from the prisoner's point of view, while still ensuring the safety and security of prisoners but there is no doubt that some prisoners and some of their supporters outside the jail continue to threaten and to intimidate both personally and by use of social media. Mr Duff, for supplement. Thank you. Uh, following on from the Minister's reference to the stock take report in the second part of his answer, can I ask the Minister, does he agree with me that essentially the stock take report was a missed opportunity to resolve the issues central to the dispute in Row House? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe the stock take report was a genuine assessment of the situation we were in. I'm extremely grateful to the team of independent assessors for the work they've done, and the prison service continues to seek to build on that, do things like the prisoner forum and other measures to make the situation as normal as possible, given the fact that separated prisoners are in an abnormal position. Called Mr. Roy Bergs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Find the fault enforcement is expensive in terms of uh, court time, legal aid costs, police enforcement costs and possibly even prison time costs. Can the Minister outline the schedule for modernising our uh, fine uh, enforcement service uh, to better match the good practice elsewhere in the United Kingdom? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, again, I don't have the details of the schedule in front of me, but the answer is work is being carried forward as urgently as possible recognizing the very significant issues in terms of court time, as he says, prison time at times, and the uh, uh, completely unexpected judicial decision that it was not possible uh, to uh, place uh, in custody fine defaulters without a further court hearing. So a lot of court time has actually been taken up to address those issues. Uh, a very large number of those cases have gone through and have gone through satisfactorily. And clearly there are issues now as we look to civilianise fine enforcement, take it away from being a burden on the police service, as we seek to ensure the additional methods by which fines will be paid, whether deducted from earnings or whatever, then there's a, you know, a better chance that in, uh, in a year or so's time we will have a much better system in operation than has been the case for a number of years. Call Mr Beggs for supplementary. Um, Given that consultation is already underway, is the Minister surprised, given the savings that could result and the huge pressure that his department is under, that his officials have indicated it could be up to two years before new legislation is introduced and it is delivered on the ground? I'm not sure where Mr Beggs gets that figure from, Principal Deputy Speaker, because certainly my expectation is that we will see legislation in this Assembly mandate, which has little more than a year to run. Um, <coughs> it will then be a matter of ensuring that all the necessary measures within that, uh, with, if necessary, supporting secondary legislation, are in place as soon as possible. Yes, it is unfortunate 
but the reality is the legislative process takes time to ensure that the matter is got right. Given that we're trying to fix a problem, there's no point in doing something rapidly which isn't going to stand the test of time and produce a viable solution for the future. Order. Time is up.